And again, hello, this is A.W. Anthony Mays, Senior Pastor of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church located in the capital city of Austin, Texas. We greet you, invite you to our Bible study, our time together where we are walking in the Word of God. I want to say to you up front that if we say something, if you have questions about something, if you want to comment about anything, you can communicate with us through email, through direct email. The email address of Pastor Mays is Pastor A W Mays at the mount.net. Love to correspond with you concerning the Word of God, concerning faith, concerning church life. Uh, we invite you to communicate with us uh, at any time. We invite you to the Mount Sinai Church. Physically, the church is addressed at 8500, that's 8500 Cameron Road on the north side of the city of Austin. I tell you that it is convenient to discover us because we are very near major highways with easy access. Come join us in person at the Mount Sinai Church on Sunday mornings. We begin with church school in-person classes. Uh, 9.45 for an hour, 10.45, 11 o'clock, we move into worship service. Now we are, in view of the pandemic, still wearing within the sanctuary, within the building, wearing our mask for protective covering. We're still uh, using hand sanitize sanitizers throughout the building, encouraging frequent hand washing. Uh, but what we're doing now is wearing masks and we're doing temperature screening. And we invite you conveniently to come and worship with us at the Mount Sinai Church on Sunday mornings in person, 11 o'clock. Wednesday evenings as well, we invite you to come into the sanctuary on Wednesday evening and to worship with us. This is Bible study, and each time that we gather for Bible study, I want to review and to share with you our Bible study strategy that we very uh, emphatically worship, uh, recommend, excuse me, recommend to uh, anyone who is serious about Bible study, the Word of God. God wants us to have His Word. He wants us to know His Word. He wants us to have His Word in, his, in our heart. He wants us to live according to the word. When you come to Bible study, we invite that you pray. Prayer is for preparation. We invite you to prayerfully come to the word of God. The simple prayer is this, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, give me understanding. Lord, calls me to see. And that uh, prepares you spiritually and mentally hopefully removing distractions, and then get actually to studying the Word of God with the first step, which is reading, reading, reading accurately, reading deliberately. What is the Word of God? Uh, do not just recite what you heard someone say, but actually look very carefully at the Word of God, because there comes many times when persons are misquoting or misreading the Word of God. And if you misquote it, if you misread it, uh, you can lead to misinterpretation of what the Bible is saying. Number one is reading. And all of the English Bibles that we have are translations, whether it's the King James Version, the New American Standard Version, uh, the Revised uh, standard version, whether it's Holman, whether it's Christian standard. There are many Bible translations in English that are available, and some of them are quite good. And I uh, start with my basic text of King James, but I refer to and compare many Bible translations so that we can have help in discovering what is the meaning from the original writings. Because, my friends, the Bible was not originally written in English. The original languages are Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And these are the writings. And anytime you have an English Bible, it's because someone 
uh, has diligently worked to bring from those languages into our English language that we might have a, a word in our own tongue. On the day of Pentecost, that was the amazing thing of the speaking in tongues is that people understood what was being said. They understood it in their own tongue. I don't believe that the uh, disciples had language lessons. I believe it was of the divine power of God that they spoke and God miraculously caused the language to be translated into different languages so that the people who came into Jerusalem could understand very plainly what was being said. Read that second chapter of the book of Acts and discover this is what was going on. Reading is the first step. But then after reading, there must be interpretation, analyzing, studying the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here I say that you could be blessed to have Bible study helps, materials of persons who have studied and have spoken to the word of God and bring helpful information that ordinary lay persons, persons not trained, not seminary trained or educated uh we can understand and benefit from those who have that special training and those special gifts from the Lord. And so I encourage you, uh, as a believer, at least have yourself a good study Bible. Purchase for yourself a good study Bible. So much information in one book uh, that's so very helpful, outlines and footnotes and cross-references and headings and articles and atlases and concordances all discovered in one volume which can be very handy and can be very helpful to understanding the word of God. The third step is very plainly do it. Apply it. Let it speak to your heart. Turn when the Bible says turn. Stand when the Bible says stand. Move when the Bible says move. The, move the principles that you discover in the word of God that we are to live by them. That's the three-step strategy. Practice it and it will bless your life. It will indeed bless your life. We're going to have prayer together and then we're going to turn to uh, the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings, uh, in your Bibles, at verse 24, at verse 24, we'll take up on tonight. But let's go to the Lord. Let's touch and agree, uniting our faith, that our time will be profitable together. Dear Lord, we ask now that you would speak to us in your word. Open our eyes. Cause us to see, grant unto us understanding of your truth. We ask it, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in chapter 6, miracles have happened for deliverance. On last week, we talked about the Syrian army that intended to capture the prophet were blinded, were blinded, and made helpless against the foe, and they were not slain, but they were led back to their home country. It's amazing, though, that because they were not destroyed, when we come to verse 24, it appears that after a period of time, the Syrians would try it again. Verse 24, and it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad king of Syria gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. He got his great army together. Somehow or another disregarding or forgetting previously that the prophet Elisha was uh, given great power over this army and uh, they were defeated. But here it is, uh, the Syrian king uh, Ben-Hadad determines 
that he's going after the city of Samaria. City Samaria is the headquarter of the nation of Israel at this time. Besieged it means to surround it. Surrounded with his great army. His great host of soldiers have made a circle around Samaria and they are not allowing anyone to enter and they're not allowing anyone to leave. And so it is only a matter of time because this is going to create a crisis. They cannot leave the protection of their walled city. Verse 25, and there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they sieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now, to understand or to get some image of how great this famine was, the historian causes us to see that the food stuff is so scarce that a donkey's head is very expensive. Four score, 80 pieces of silver just for a donkey's head. Matters not right now that the donkey is an unclean animal that in the dietary laws that um, Israel is for, forbidden to eat such an animal, but when there is a famine, these kinds of rules and laws and regulations are being cast aside for the sake that the people are starving, the people are hungry, and because people are starving, because there is the enemy surrounding the city, that this may be indelicate, but that's what the Bible says, uh, a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now, just plainly what I'm saying is that they were capturing the waste matter of doves or pigeons. A cab would be about a pint. You have a Bible study material and you have a section in Bible study material uh, where it helps to translate measures and weights from biblical terms into terms that we would understand. And so by researching uh, this fourth part of a cab, we learned that he was talking about perhaps roughly a pint, a pint of bird's waste has a price of five pieces of silver. You know when food is scarce, the price goes up. The price goes up. It goes far and away beyond the ordinary price. We know that in our land today, the, the shortage, the threatening of shortage of gasoline is, is causing us now to uh, pay more for gasoline and fuel for our automobiles than what uh, we've ever paid, but it has to do with shortage and scarcity. And so because of the scarcity of food, because the city has been besieged, these food items are very expensive. And verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, he, he, he's, he's watching, he's looking, there's nothing much that he can do because this great army uh, has surrounded his city. Uh, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my Lord, O King. She cries out that the king, the leader of the people, would render her some help. And verse 27, 
this unnamed king, some Bible materials try to name him as Jehoram, but in the he historian's record, he does not name him. He's king of Israel, but in this recording, he's without a name. But this woman, this desperate woman is crying out to the king for help. This is going to be a little bit like uh, the woman who cried to Solomon for help for justice. Well, what is her issue? Verse 27, the king says, and he said, if the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? In other words, the king is talking about if God doesn't help you, where can I find help? What can I do for you? This is a king who realizes how helpless he is, how someone crying to him for help is uh, going to be disappointed because there's nothing uh, that he's able to do. And the king said unto her, this is verse 28, what aileth thee? In other words, what is your problem? What, what is the matter? Here is her answer. She said in verse 28, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Cannibalism. Eating human flesh. This is not the only time under very grave circumstances that humans have eaten human flesh for the sake of hunger or for the sake of being savages. Um, this is a desperate situation. Here is the picture of two mothers who each have a son and they're so desperate that they make an agreement to each share the other's son. That's how desperate it is. That's how grave this famine is. And the, the, the agreement was made. And so this woman says they probably boiled, maybe, I don't know, roasted, the manner of, of, uh, of killing and eating the son, it said that, uh, verse 29, we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. In other words, instead of uh, fulfilling the agreement, this mother uh takes her son into hiding. What has she done? She has accomplished the nourishment that probably will last her for some days, and she has um, tricked the other mother in allowing that uh, she ate of her son, but when it came time for her to deliver her son for it, she hid him. And so here is this very pitiful picture of women threatening and actually the cannibalizing of one infant who is eaten for the sake of their hunger. So at verse 30, and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes. This is something so terrible in the impression of this king that he tore his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Now it's something about him wearing the sackcloth which is grieving and mourning very often uh, repentance is demonstrated by putting on the very irritating and uncomfortable material of sackcloth. Maybe if you're old enough and uh, can think about those days when they talk about a burlap sack, 
You're talking about a very rough material, uh, uncomfortable, itching and scratching. But the king, even though he was doing it, he was not allowing the people to see it until he rent his garment and it was discovered. Much can thought about why um, he was doing this uh, without making it public that he was wearing sackcloth. Um, then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. For some reason, Israel's king is angry toward the prophet. It means that he believes that the circumstance that they're dealing with somehow or another has been caused by the prophet. And he threatens to take the prophet's life. Oh, how short is his memory to think that he could lay hands on God's man to carry out this threat. He's been witness, I'm sure, to the miraculous power of Elisha. And it's going to be uh, discovered in this passage as we go along. Look at the threat in verse 31. But where is Elisha? Verse 32 shares with us. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? In King James' Bible, perhaps it is not so clear, but but when the king makes this threat upon the wall of the city after hearing the desperate cry of this mother who believes she's been defrauded of having the other mother's son to eat, he has turned, the king has turned his anger toward Elisha. Elisha is at his home, and sitting around him are the elders, the influential leaders of the nation, and Elisha is aware, although he did not physically hear it, God has revealed to him the threat made by the king. And Elisha says, here comes this messenger of the murderer, and he tells the elders to secure the messenger, hold him fast, do not let him go, because he says coming behind the messenger is the king. So somehow or another, the king is on his way, I believe, to carry out this threat. And Elisha has forestalled the messenger. Look at verse 33. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? He is saying that this circumstance has been allowed by the Lord. And it is that we are to accept what God has allowed, what God in his sovereignty has directed. 
And so here is the prophecy of Elisha as we go into chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, the next day, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Fine flour, two measures of barley at a very reasonable price. Remember the famine has caused the cost of even unclean foodstuff such as a donkey's head and of dove's dung to be 80 pieces of silver and five pieces of silver. But now fine flour and two measures of barley for just a shekel. By tomorrow, the next day, within 24 hours, what a prophecy this, this is. So then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God, that is one of the officials, one of the um, persons who was close to the king. He hears this prophecy and here's his response. He said, behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be, in other words, he doesn't believe how there could be such a turnaround. The people are so desperate. The food is so scarce. How by tomorrow can such a thing be? He's expressing his doubt. He's expressing his disbelief. This is about uh, the windows of heaven is kind of his exaggerated way of saying, even if God did that, it would not be enough for this word to come true. And so he said, this is Elisha talking to that man. He said, behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. This is not the first time in the Bible where persons are able to witness the miraculous, wonder-working power of God, but not be able to appropriate it because of their doubt, because of their disbelief. This is akin to John the Baptist, his father the priest, that when he heard about having a son at his old age and his wife was uh, aged and for the angel to say he was going to become a father, uh, his words of doubt caused that God struck him mute, mute, that for a while he would not be able to speak because he had not believed the word of God. This, in our Bible lesson today, is about a man who heard something so wonderful, too marvelous to believe, that he didn't think it could happen. And the prophet Elisha says it's going to be, it's going to be because God has promised it because it is the word of God and because there's nothing too hard for God. It is going to happen. The prices for food is going to come way down on tomorrow. On tomorrow, there will be ample supply. On tomorrow, you'll see it, but you won't be able to eat of it. You'll be a witness to it, but it will not be a blessing to you because of your doubt. Well, time-wise, we're going to stop right there in chapter 7 and Mark verse 3. We'll take up when we come back 
together again. Remember, if you have any questions or comments or sharing with us, we're welcoming your emails to us at pastorawmays at the mount.net. Love to see you in church. Go in the Lord's peace.